I used to do a lot of public speaking in the community. And one time, I got myself in a little trouble. Not big trouble, but I definitely lost my audience. Now, I was just trying to be funny, and I thought that it was clever. I told my audience that half of the public school students in our community are below average. And in fact, despite some recent, recent initiatives, still half of our students were below average. And it was at this point I began to get some pushback from members of the audience who wanted to know, first of all, where did I get those numbers? And are those true? And I think we have 70 or 80 percent of our students who are above average. And at that point, other members of the audience who knew math started to chuckle, and that's where things really went off the rails. And it wouldn't have been quite so bad, except I was speaking to a group of public school educators. So I advise you to never use that particular joke in that setting. It didn't work well for me. However, I can tell you exactly how I know that half of students are below average. And that is because the mean mathematically is defined as the point below which half of scores will fall. And the mean always has half of the scores above it. The mean is the point for 50% of the scores. And that is our main takeaway for this lecture about the empirical rule. This is a picture of a standard normal distribution. We can see that it has a mean of zero right there in the middle. And it has a standard deviation of one. We can see positive one standard deviation to the right, positive two, and positive three. To the left, negative one, negative two, and negative three. And because a standard normal curve is symmetrical, there are exactly the same number of scores from zero to positive one as there are from zero to negative one. And exactly one half of all scores will be below the mean, and the other half will be above the mean. In terms of proportion, the value would be 0 0.5000. And although there is a standard proportion of scores between zero and two standard deviations, the number of scores from zero to one is not half the amount of zero to two. There are many more scores near the mean as we move further from the mean, there are fewer and fewer scores. And this has implications for us in the real world. You see, if your score is near the mean, it's very easy to move in one direction or another. If we're looking at physical fitness, if you are, as my doctor politely described me, deconditioned, all you have to do is add a few minutes of exercise, maybe 20 or 30 minutes of exercise per day, and you will see massive improvements in your physical health because you are already at the mean or perhaps slightly below the mean. It's really easy to move in that range. On the other hand, if you are an elite athlete, you have to work many hours per day to get small incremental improvement in your performance. Once you get out into the tails of the distribution, it becomes much more difficult to move any further away from the mean. And let me illustrate this with something that I saw at a local college carnival that we had at the end of the year. You see, these guys are in some kind of bouncy toy, and they have been tethered to that back wall with a piece of heavy elastic band. Their challenge is to run from the wall as far as they can down that alleyway, and then to mark how far they got, they would put some kind of marker which contained Velcro in that middle strip. Now, what you would know is that if you were right next to the wall at the beginning point, it would be very easy to take one or two or three steps. Think of the wall as the mean 
and the elastic as the standard deviation. As you took four, five, or six steps, the resistance would be much stronger than it would be close to the mean. And the further you move away from the mean, the more resistance you get. The consequence of this in the real world is called regression toward the mean. That as people or scores move further away from the mean, they are much more likely to regress back toward the mean than they are to continue to move further and further away. One example of this is in sports. One researcher studied the children of elite athletes and found that although sons would often follow in their father's footsteps going into football or some other athletic pursuit, they rarely eclipsed the greatness of their Hall of Fame fathers. They were more likely to be, well, normal, to have moved back toward the mean. Returning now to the empirical rule, we already know that in a normal distribution, half of the scores are above the mean and half of the scores are below the mean. However, the empirical rule further teaches us that there is a standard number of scores between any two standard deviations. For instance, 68% of the scores in a standard normal distribution will be between positive one and negative one standard deviations. Between positive two and negative two standard deviations, we will find 95% of the scores. And 99% of the scores will be between negative three and positive three standard deviations. And because of this, the empirical rule is sometimes called the 68-95-99 rule. Now look at that gap between zero and positive one standard deviations, 0.3413. That means that 34.13% of scores are between zero and one standard deviation. Between one and two standard deviations, we find 13.59% of the scores. And notice that exactly those same proportions exist between zero and negative one standard deviations, or zero and negative two standard deviations. And remember that one quarter of a standard deviation does not contain one quarter of the scores between zero and one. There will be many more scores between zero and 0.25 than there, than there would be between 0.75 and one. The further we move away from the mean, the fewer scores are represented in that portion of the curve. Because we now know that there are standard proportions anywhere within our standard normal distribution, we could apply our z-scores to determine where each of the men from our example fall relative not only to each other, but to all men who have taken the same test. Where would these z-scores fall? Shifty, with his negative 2.50 z-score, would be way down on the left end of that distribution. Mickey is slightly above the mean, with his z-score of 0 0.50, and Antonio would be far up on the right end of the bell curve with his z-score of positive 3.00. And now we can apply these z-scores to know how far each individual is above everyone else below on that normal distribution. So for instance, Shifty, with that z-score of negative 2.50, way down in that low region of the distribution is more attractive than only 0.62% of all other male test takers on this test of male attractiveness. Mickey, who is slightly above the mean, we know will be more attractive than at least half of the men. However, at 0.5 standard deviations above the mean, he is more attractive than 69.15% of all men who have taken this test. 
And as you might imagine, Antonio, with his score of Z of positive 3.00, is more attractive than 99.87% of all men. That Antonio is a handsome guy. Where did I get these numbers? I used something called a Z table as I was doing the math. You have a copy of the Z table at the back of your notes, but you will also receive an Excel spreadsheet which uses these same proportions to speed up and simplify the math for determining where Z scores fall relative to other scores in a standard normal distribution. Thank you.